here from Auburn Palmery. So here's the CTO of Auburn Palmery, also uh, under current. Yep. Um, so he has over 30 years of experience in tech, and I think he also talked talk a bit more about uh, this company, what they do, sure. and also the Auburn uh, platform. Uh, so since we have already learned a bit about Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think it's a really nice opportunity to uh, also open our eyes to, to see what uh, else are out there. Okay, so um, without further ado, uh, yeah. How, how does this work? Uh, okay, so uh, this is some channel, right? As you know, you can, you can join the channel and send your uh, questions there. Uh, later, the question will show up on the screen, and you may decide uh, to address them immediately or after the talk. All right. Okay. So I think in the first half, uh, Michael gave us the lecture, and in the second half, we'll move to LT12, and then we'll do a lab demo here, and then some Q&A uh, afterwards. Okay. Yeah. So, so the same is yours. All right. Please. Thank you. So everyone can hear, right? Okay. So. Let's get into it. Okay, so for me, um, I've spent my life trying to figure out what is the purpose of life, of human life. Why am I here? What should I do with it, right? And I think that's an existential question that most people ask. And I think it's very important to understand that before you embark in any kind of career journey or anything like that. So. Where it started for me is I grew up in Southern Africa and in Southern Africa there is a cultural phenomenon there called the dreams of your father. So culturally uh, what they instill in you is that you have to accomplish all the dreams that your father could not. And so in the beginning that seemed like the thing that my life should be about. Right? And I did that by the age of 29, and then I had nothing left to, to do in my life, so I had to find another way to sort of find a philosophy to live by. So for the longest time, I believe that one good principle is living a life with no regrets. And so for what I used to do is I used to just say yes to every opportunity. No matter what it was, I would try it, I would do it. Thinking that, you know, I would regret not doing things. But I came to the realization actually that you end up regretting the things you did do. Uh, so that didn't work for me. Then I got into this idea that, okay, maybe the whole purpose of life is actually understanding your your gender role, your um, how you fit inside of the, the framework of society, and what does it mean to be a man and masculine in today's society. And that actually did give me a lot of answers, but it's not really a framework for life either. I watch a lot of popular culture, right? And so at one point I was convinced, living in the United States, that perhaps the answer to life is resource accumulation. So go out there, make as much money as you can, uh, everything's about resource accumulation, right? And uh, favorite, one of my favorite movies, the quote is like, you know, they have you chasing cars and clothes, buying, you know, things that you don't need. And that's very true. If you ever go through any kind of loss in your life, you'll, you'll come to the realization that actually you will trade all your financial and material wealth just for one more day with that person or one more opportunity at that thing that you lost. So this didn't actually work for me either. So what I came to the realization slowly over my life is actually the only thing that matters is relationships and the impact that you have with other people. At the end of the day, um, that's all that you're remembered for and that's all that really matters at the end. And so for me, it's all about impact. It's about what you do and the changes you have on the people around you and nothing more. So I said, so I set out in my career to chase impact. Um, in 2008, I found myself in Washington, D.C. and uh, I was running a, a mobile marketing company that I'd started there. Uh, Obama was a senator at that point. He came to us, he said, hey, I'm running for president. Please, can you help us build a mobile marketing engine? Uh, so we, we took that on. We actually uh, built the ground, the, the infrastructure that manages groundwork. So one 
volunteer, had a hundred different voters, and they had a personal relationship with those hundred voters, and they knew all the issues that those voters cared about. We built the infrastructure for that. So that was a pretty good impact for me. Later on in my, in my career, I was in China. I was building AI robots. You see a picture of it there. And this little robot would run around uh, kids' homes like a vacuum machine, and you'd have to talk to it. Uh, and, and it would teach STEAM subjects through AI. And we got involved with a bunch of orphanages and uh, you know, used the kids to train uh, AI so that it would understand Mandarin. That was also a pretty good impact. Uh, recently, the last picture on there, uh, I was actually in Marrakesh in Morocco as part of Algo Foundry, putting a curriculum for, for blockchain development into a university in Morocco. And the students over here are basically learning to be blockchain uh, engineers, and they have a path for you know, further education or, or a path for getting higher paying jobs, three or four times the national average. That was also a pretty big, big impact, right? So the question is, is, you know, did I come to this understanding of impact because I'm an engineer, or am I an engineer because I, I care about impact? I think it's a little bit of both. But one of the things that matters very greatly in engineering is domain knowledge, right? So in, in traditional engineering, when you are, let's say, a civil engineer, or a aeronautic engineer or something like this, even a chemical engineer, it's very easy to understand the things that you're building. If you want to build a bridge or a road, you've used a bridge or a road before. If you want to build a rocket ship, you know what a rocket ship does. But in software engineering, it's pretty nebulous and vague, right? So you could be a software engineer that, that cares about, or works in the e-commerce field. You could be a software engineer that works in AI, right? But at the end of the day, if you want to build great products, you have to know what those products are and how they impact the lives of the users that use them. If you don't, you cannot build great products. Right? So this is a very important part of engineering and I think it's often overlooked, especially in software engineering. A lot of people come into our venture studio and they ask us, hey, can you build us something for the blockchain? Uh, which blockchain? A lot of people come into our venture studio and they ask us, hey, can you build us something for the blockchain? Uh, which blockchain should we use? And my question is always, why? Why do you need blockchain, right? What is the reason to do this in a decentralized manner? So I thought a lot about the why of things. And uh, one of the things I'd just like to share with you is adoption, right? So everyone, probably knows what a car, electricity, TV, internet, right, is. A car is one of the, the things that has changed human uh, existence more than a, almost any other invention, right? Every, anywhere you go, third world, first world, doesn't matter, you can get access to a vehicle, you can get access to cars and transportation, right? But from the time it was invented to the time when it was actually mass adopted around the world is quite a long time. It's more than 100 years, 105, 110 years. Right. The next invention, electricity, I mean, you guys can't even imagine a life without electricity, right? Um, it's ubiquitous. It's, it drives everything in humanity. But this also took almost 75 years from the time it was invented to mass adoption. And they went through all kinds of wars of DC, AC, electrocuting elephants and all kinds of things before people bought into this idea. Right. Uh, and then finally, like TV, right? Everybody has a TV, everyone consumes media. Right? If it's on your phone, on your iPad, um, what's life without media? You also find that it's very hard to imagine. Took a very long time as well, over 60 years, right? Finally, the internet. This is, up until recently, the quickest adopted technology in human history, right? Can anyone imagine not having the internet? Okay, like, sometimes I try to imagine it actually. Uh, you know, go to a beach, switch off your phone. But this took seven and a half years for the whole world to adopt a mass adoption. It's the fastest thing ever until the blockchain. So, as of right now, we're four years into mass adoption of blockchain, and we are already reaching the level that the internet reached. Right? So, it is, as of right now, the fastest adopted technology in human history. And within the next 10 years, uh, it's going to be the same 
when, when you say, oh, I'm a software developer, but I don't do anything on the blockchain, will sound just as ludicrous as I'm a software engineer, but I don't do anything on the internet. Right? This is something that's coming and you absolutely need to adopt it. So this is one of the reasons why I say why blockchain. It's very important for the future of software engineering. Let's talk about the philosophy and the reasons why it's important. Decentralization is a big one. Uh, you'll find that in today's society we've become much more centralized as technology has progressed. Centralization has also progressed. Uh, Silicon Valley right now controls all of the data, uh, you know, through the messaging apps or the majority of it. Um, people are interacting with Web2 in a way that there's a centralized authority. Uh, it, it basically puts the, the decision making in the hands of a few people. Decentralization is one of the core parts of blockchain, blockchain technology, right? So it enables you to, to think about things as multiple participants owning the system that they're participating in. And it actually, this technology forces you to build applications in this way. You don't actually have a choice. Very hard to do without it. And social decentralization uh, will really change the way that people participate and cooperate in the future, actually. Another tenet of blockchain that's very important to the why is trust. So in a centralized uh, manner, you have to trust the, the participant that you're interacting with. So if you think about banks or insurance or government or healthcare, uh, the people that control those systems basically are the ones that you trust and you'll make decisions based on who you trust. Well, decentralization and blockchain bring in a trustless environment where you promote confidence through distributed consensus, through deterministic computation so that you can predict it, and through cryptography so that you can verify it. And so these are the reasons primarily to use blockchain. Um, probably if you've gone through some part of this course already, you already know how blockchain technology works, so I won't spend too much time on it. But basically, this is the flow where a transaction is submitted to a bunch of nodes, there's a consensus. Uh, once it's been validated, the, that transaction is added to a block, and it's immutable, and it's complete, right? If you don't understand how this works, I'm sure there's a lot of coursework out here, a lot of stuff on the internet you can go and look up. I encourage you to do that. So, as I've said, blockchain already is very ubiquitous. It's already widely accepted in, in, in the world, um, uh, fastly adopted. A lot of people already know about the financial aspect of blockchain. So uh, DeFi, obviously, cryptocurrencies, um, and these things. And that's the reason for that is finance drives and, and commerce drives everything in the world. Without it, there's very little incentive structures, right? But there are so many other things that the blockchain is already doing behind the scenes that you probably don't even know about, right? From, you know, you know integrity management, governance, uh, IoT, health, uh, education, all kinds of things. Um, you know, so, some of the things that surprised me was, for example, uh, Singapore Airlines, Chris Flyer, is already using blockchain to manage that. Right? You, you just don't even know it's happening. Uh, here's a few uh, very specific examples, uh, you know, in food and supply systems. Um, banking, finance, sorry, um, healthcare, and so on. Now, specifically, Algorand. Uh, this is uh, what our venture studio uh, focuses on. It's a it's a layer one blockchain. Uh, the reason why we believe in Algorand over other chains comes down to basic philosophy. If you if you think about uh, blockchain being adopted. Generally, you have to really ask yourself, uh, is this going to be something that can come into our lives and be adopted worldwide by everyone in every country without governments, without institutional support? Is that, is that something you believe? We don't think so. We think that, you know, basically, if you want this to be everywhere, you have to have everyone accept it. And so institutional adoption, governmental adoption is very important for layer one blockchains. Uh, in our view, Algorand is the layer one blockchain that is the most suited for institutional adoption and for a variety of reasons. Um, they basically have built something into the layer one 
which allows institutions to do a lot of things that have to be done on higher layers than other blockchains. For example, um, there's compliance features like clawing back certain tokens. Um, there's you know, uh, much higher security and other things. We'll get into it in a little bit later. Uh, one of the other things about about blockchains that you have to consider when you when you're selecting one is the throughput and the finality. Right. So one of the you know, if you guys already sort of studied Bitcoin and Ethereum, what you will know about those those uh, blockchains is that they have a consensus mechanism that requires quite a lot of waiting time for confirmations. Why? Because uh, their consensus mechanism basically has a wide network and many, many nodes have to validate and then you have to wait for those confirmations before something is final, right? Otherwise, uh, someone could do a double spend or other things. With, with Algorand, find, uh, it, the blocks are final as soon as they hit the blockchain. So the moment they appear, they're final. There's no more, you don't have to wait for confirmations. And the throughput is around 6,000 uh, transactions per second. Algorand also has future-proof tech, right? So one of the, the, the things that's looming um, in the future is quantum computing. So quantum computing, uh, allows you to break uh, cryptography that's based on big prime numbers because they can do a lot of things in parallel, right? Uh, in non-polar and non time. But uh, Algorand uses Falcon keys, for example, that prevents it from being broken from quantum computers. So there's a lot of reasons why. Um, another thing that we consider, and this is part of a venture studio and, and operating as a venture studio, whenever we select technologies, we always consider who is the team behind the technology that we get to work with? Because at the end of the day, every business is a people business. Uh, Silvio Michali is the guy that invented um, Algorand. He uh, is a world-renowned um, cryptographer. He's won many prizes. He's, he teaches at MIT. Um, if you're going to pick someone to do a cryptography project, he'd be in the, in the top five in the world, definitely. So some of the things that Algorand does um, which other blockchains, you know, struggle to do is, first of all, it's permissionless. Uh, most blockchains are. It can scale to billions of users, and that's and that's a big deal. If we're talking about uh, adoption uh, worldwide, the scale of the blockchain is very important. The uh, transactions per second is at six thousand. This is a, a number that they wanted to hit because uh, Visa, which is one of the biggest payment networks out there, Mastercard also another big payment network out there, combined, uh, achieved somewhere around 6,000 transactions per second. So Algorand already is capable of doing all of, of the majority of the payments uh, with its TPS number. Uh, it has very quick blocks. Um, there are some uh, you know, blockchains that are quicker, Solana is an example, but uh, Algorand doesn't go down every week, so like, that's also an advantage, I guess. Uh, it has very low fees, and why is that important? Um, so uh, it, just an anecdotal thing that happened to us. We had uh, a group come in that was doing some kind of commodities exchange at some point. They wanted to put their ledger on a blockchain, and we spent an hour talking to them. Uh, you know, what's your tokenization? What's your what's your model? They're like, oh, we don't want any crypto. We just we just want to write the transactions to the blockchain. The reason is that the transaction fees were so low that it's cheaper for them to do that than than go and get an AWS and create a database. Actually, that's how cheap it is. It costs sub cents to do a transaction. Um, you know, it's impossible to fork. Obviously, we talked about finality. Uh, the node requirements to run Algorand are, are pretty low, so cheap. Uh, they have a proof of uh, stake, a pure proof of stake consensus, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. And it's the first layer one blockchain that's actually carbon negative at the moment. So by using Algorand, you actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. Um, the pure proof of stake is actually quite a big deal. It's the reason why Algorand uh, actually uh, was invented. and Basically how it works is they select, uh, uh, they select basically a proposer and, a, and validators every, every block and it's done randomly. It's using an algorithm which is uh, verifiably random and basically you, you have a like higher view, you have more stake, right? But generally speaking, because of the way that they've done this, it's, 
theoretically impossible to do 51% attacks and other things like this. Uh, one of the things that we like to focus on in, um, in our Venture Studio is DeFi. And the reason why we focus on DeFi is because of the adoption issue. Uh, what you'll notice in just about everything in the world, it runs on some kind of form of payment, right? It doesn't matter what it is. I mean, uh, if you're going to see a movie, you're paying. If you go out and eat, you're paying, right? Any kind of entertainment, you're paying. Any product, you're paying. So there's some kind of commerce and payment in everything in, in life. Even if you're just walking down the street, you know, in order to create that street and maintain it, the government's paying using your taxes, right? So there's always finances involved in everything. Uh, that's it's particularly true when it comes to blockchain projects. Because of the decentralized nature of it, uh, most of the participants in projects uh, pay a little bit for every transaction, right? And so in terms of being an engineer, the main knowledge, understanding how finance works and DeFi works is a very important part, right? Uh, there's cornerstones of DeFi uh, that make things happen. So on the blockchain, obviously, uh, a lot of the algorithms are using uh, real-world data. Uh, an oracle is something that uh, puts real-world data onto the blockchain. So a good example of that is, for example, you want to build an insurance application, right? So insurance requires verifiable information. So for example, let's imagine someone bought a plane ticket and they bought insurance. If the plane uh, got, you know, the flight got canceled, they get the insurance paid out. Well, how does the, the information on the blockchain know that that flight got canceled, right? The only way that they would be able to do that is through an oracle that would take that information from an airline and push it onto the blockchain for analysis. So oracles are a very important part, a cornerstone of blockchain and DeFi. Another one is uh, about trading. So in, in traditional, uh, finance, how a trade works is uh, this person A and person B and I'm the centralized party. Person A will tell me, hey, I have a resource, I want to sell for $1,000. Person B will say, I have $1,000, I want to buy the resource, and I will match those two things together. When it comes to decentralization, obviously there's no uh, person that's doing matching, and so there has to be an uh, established way to, to, to get an exchange rate between products. And that's what an AMM does. Uh, it basically allows for a pool of product A and pool of product B to exist with an exchange rate and it, it changes the exchange rate as the trades are happening. So this is another cornerstone of DeFi. These are things that you guys absolutely need to understand if you're going to be blockchain engineers. Right, so we talked a lot about the theory about how things work, but how does it actually touch users, right? That's what a, a what I say DAP, you guys probably say D apps, right? Do. There are the layer between the user visualization and interaction and the actual blockchain itself and, and you know, how that all works. So you can think of it as uh, either a mobile phone app or a website or something like this that inter interacts with the blockchain. On Algorand specifically, these are the, the current, uh, some of the current um, you know, applications that are running out there that we have borrowing and lending with uh, folks finance, so Algify as well. Um, there's decentralized exchanges for, for trading, uh, Pact and Tiny Man. There's stable coins that are pegged to actual, um, you know, fiat currency and liquid governance, which allows you to participate in the decision making of the network and still maintain your crypto, right? Okay, so that's more or less a theory. Let's talk about how it actually works, right? So Algorand uh, has a thing called a virtual machine. Um, every blockchain that does smart contracts has a thing called a virtual machine. It uses virtualization because there is no specific hardware that you're interacting with, right? So computer science in general is a, a state machine and everything in computer science is a state machine. What I mean by that is, it's about managing the state. Even what you're seeing here on the screen right now in terms of visualization of some slide is managing state, right? So it's, there's a bunch of pixels and you know that that pixel is supposed to be red and that one's supposed to be black, and that's a state, right? If I change the slide, it changes the state. So the whole of computer science is based on this concept. Um, in order to change state, you have to have operations. So, for
For example, if I want to change the state of one of these pixels, uh, I need to be able to add or subtract or multiply, right? These are operations. And these operations are typically done through hardware layers. So uh, a cell phone or a laptop or something like this has a CPU and that CPU does the calculations and changes the state in the memory. Now, obviously on the blockchain, there's no hardware layer. So using virtualization, they create something that emulates hardware, right? And so this emulation has got opcodes, which allow you to change the state and it has memory, which contains the state. Right? And that's what the Algorand virtual machine basically does with programming languages. Uh, Ethereum does the same thing. It has an EVM. Um, you know, anything that has programming needs this kind of virtualization. In Algorand specifically, they use a language called Teal, which is uh, an execution um, language. And basically what this Teal is, is a very low level assembly language. Um, and if you guys have ever done embedded programming uh, on, on chips, if you haven't, uh, this is how it works. Uh, if you've ever coded for a website, well that website is running on a, hot, on a, on a thing, maybe probably Linux, which is running on hardware, and the hardware uses this kind of language in order to communicate with all the different pieces, right? So this is the lowest level uh, piece. And how, how it basically works is similar to what you're seeing here. There, there is, this is basically assembly, right? So uh, you have different types of opcodes. These are the TXN, the ARG, and so on. You have different uh, memory addresses. These are the pieces of, of memory and the state that it's managing, and then you have uh, you know, intrinsic or native ops, which are the equals, equals, and the ands, which are doing comparisons or, or greater than, smaller than, right? Um, and basically, once you have this kind of program written, you'd, you'd make a compiler, a compiler would make a binary, and then upload that onto the blockchain, and it would <coughs> exist on the blockchain at a specific address. And then, you know, anybody could interact with it or uh, look at the state of what's being saved there. Now, I don't know about you guys, uh, but we've actually built a bunch of applications in Teal, and um, I can tell you it's it's very challenging for uh, a development team to manage 10,000, 15,000 lines of assembly language. It's very, very challenging. Let's imagine you have five programmers that are all working on you have five programmers that are all working on a, on a set of code, and it looks like that, right? 10,000 lines of that, right? Oh, we made a mistake, guys. Uh, you know, we, want, uh, we wanted to add 10, not subtract 10. Okay, good luck, right? Finding it and, and maintaining it. And so this is not a very good practice, um, and so we need high-level languages. In, in Ethereum, uh, there is Viper and Solidity. You guys have probably already covered that. Um, with Algorand, they decided to, to integrate Python. And basically, Python is a high-level language which wraps Teal. And when you compile, uh, what you'll find is that it compiles down to Teal source code, which is the assembly language that we just saw. And then it gets compiled into bytecode and uploaded. So it's just one more layer in front of Teal. Right? And this could be any language, by the way. Um, any language that you wanted to build a compiler for, you could compile down into Teal. This is a common practice um, you know, in computer science. But right now, PyTeal is the, the best, um, or <clears throat> most developed programming language for, for Algorand. So it's not, <clears throat> it's not that simple. It's not just basic Python, you still have to um, stay within the constraints of the actual virtual machine. Uh, you, for example, in, in, in traditional Python, you can return one. <clears throat> in, uh, you know, if you're going to be, be compiling down to Algorand, you have to have the type, right? So you can, there, there's different constraints about it. <clears throat> and then basically what's happening is, this is an example of the Python code on the, on the left. And you're defining, um, you know, functions just like you would in, in, in Python, and it will create the teal version of that if, if you stay within the constraints of uh, of what teal allows. Right. 
So let's imagine that you you have these these contracts that you've that you've written, right? And why? How does it work? And and why would you do this, right? So if you're going to do a a website that's more complicated, let's say it's an auction or it's some kind of uh, commerce or something like your this. application does, right? So you'll you'll find that if you're a reputable company, if you're like Amazon or or something like this, uh, this is not a problem. Um, but for smaller companies, it is. Uh, if you're doing Web two, it's very clear where your servers are. It's very clear. Um, you know how you're doing your business, and it's easy to attack, and people know how to attack it, right? And so, if you build this in a decentralized manner using uh, smart contracts, basically you get the advantages of blockchain, which is decentralization, uh, trustless environment. It's verifiable. It's predictable. Um, it makes things a lot easier. And this is the the argument for building in decentralized, uh, you know, de decentralized ways. And basically, uh, you know, it's not free, just, just so you know, like it's also possible to attack smart contracts. And I'm sure that you've probably seen on the news and other places that, you know, the millions of dollars have been lost this way as well. So, you know, you have to take care of security. Uh, so basically, in Algorand, they have, uh, as I said, there's a, there's a couple of things that they've done in the, in the design which is actually quite interesting and makes it institutionally adoptable. And one of the things is that they've split out the idea of a, of a stateless contract and a stateful contract. So a stateful contract basically operates on the blockchain and allows you to save state, which is very, very important. A stateless contract has no state at all and it is just an address on the blockchain, but it can be used for things that uh, are very hard to do on other chains. For example, delegated signing uh, is, is a prime example of this, right? So for example, um, we have one application, which is a bridge, which goes between Algorand and Ethereum, and part of the bridge is doing an airdrop of algos. When people go from Ethereum to Algorand, we wanna make sure that they have enough algo in order to transact with that that transact or that token that came across and what we do is we we actually introspect the wallet look at the algo the, you know the one that's going to be receiving it and then we potentially airdrop some algo to them so that they can actually use it right so how do we do that so if you think about security if we just uh you know put a wallet on the server and we put a bunch of algos there and we just send some algos sometimes when people are using the bridge that means that if someone breaks into that server, they can take all the algos. Well, what about uh, people that work within our organization, right? Um, a bad actor, a system administrator, can also take all the algos, right? And so the way that we secure that is we use what's called a stateless uh, smart contract. And, and what that is is a piece of logic that gets run every time you sign with it. So it creates a signature, a, a key, almost like a private key in Ethereum that allows spending out of a wallet, but the logic is run every time that happens, and, and then that logic can constrain that spending to specific parameters. For example, it can't be more than a certain amount, it has to uh, be part of a bridging transaction, it has to go to these kind of wallets, or so on and so forth. Um, this is a design a decision by Algorand that no other chain has, and it, it, it makes very powerful use cases, right? So, under current tech, just uh, to, to kind of wrap it up, uh, we build financial tools, um, not only on Algorand uh, blockchain, but also on cross-chain. Um, and we're experts in, in DeFi and finance when it comes to uh, blockchain. Some of the tools that we um, have already built uh, on the left here is Algorai Finance that will be uh, coming out actually on Friday. It's a decentralized options vault um, which allows people to uh, deposit and uh, you know basically profit from the volatility of, a, of an asset. Um, and this is a groundbreaker for us, an uh, impact piece for us because uh, you know in, in DeFi right now uh, it's very difficult for, for people to get 
uh, any kind of profit because of several uh, design constraints around projects. They either have uh, Ponsonomics, which means that they uh, basically design the tokenization so that you have to have a permit scheme, more people have to come in to pay the people before, or they have uh, what's called a permanent loss, which means that they pay you in tokens that don't have liquidity. Uh, Algorai uh, pays you in the token that you deposit. Obviously, Foundry is a venture studio uh, that does algorithm based stuff. That's something that, that we put together with Undercurrent. Uh, we also have a lot of, of uh, you know, of, of curriculum and coursework. Um, we've, we've put this into different universities and so on around the world. Um, Messina is a bridge that I mentioned that goes between Algorand and Ethereum. This is another product that's coming out. And we also have uh, GameFi Studio, so we do a bunch of different types of games on the blockchain. Right? Um, so these are the references for everything that I've talked about. Obviously, you'll get, you guys will get a copy of this. You can uh, read those papers as well. They're very insightful. And, uh, and then also there's a, a bunch of sources about Algren, um, you know, to educate yourself about it as well. Um, and that's the end of that presentation. So I'll go to your questions before we go to demo, right? All right, is Teal Turing complete? Um, in the beginning, it was not. Uh, very recently, uh, they've, they've gone through a lot of changes in Teal. Uh, it's, Starting around Teal 4, it became Turing complete because they added the ability to loop, uh, have subroutines, and, and, and these types of things. Um, so at this point, with Teal 6, that's the current latest version, it is a Turing, a Turing complete language, yes. Why we need ASM like language like Teal? Why not directly compile contract into bytecode from a high level language? Okay, yeah. That's, that's, an, interesting, that's an interesting question. So, it's, it's a philosophy debate again. Um, okay, I see, it's coming from the top, right. Um, it's a philosophy debate, right? So when you start a computer science project, uh, what you have to always concern yourself with is how do you start to build a tool stack, right? And so if you start with just going directly into bytecode, with, without having this uh, um, assembly language in between. What ends up happening is it becomes very, very difficult for an engineering team to debug what's happening in your virtual language, in your virtual environment. And so typically what you'll see is when people start working on stacks in computer science, they, they, they uh, do layers of abstraction, kind of like, you know, quoting Shrek, layers of an onion, right? And usually what will end up happening is you'll have a virtual environment, an assembly language on top of it, uh, uh, and then basically a higher level language, and then a higher level language, and so on, right? That's just basically how, how uh, people do it. And what you will also find is that languages are actually um, methods of constraint. They're not uh, things that enable things. They're things that stop you from doing things. Uh, that's lost on a lot of people actually. So if you have a very generalized language where you can do anything you want, typically it's not very efficient. Uh, as you start adding higher and higher level languages, you start to see things slow down because they become more and more generalized. So what you'll see, for example, with um, uh, what you'll see, I, I'm going to have to use the mouse, it looks like, right? Um, what you'll see, for example, is stuff like uh, on EVM with Solidity, super amazing. It's very much like TypeScript or JavaScript, and you can do a lot of different stuff with it, but you only do seven transactions a second. Why? Because it's a generalized language. When you, when you work in an assembly, it's very easy to understand, right? So it's like, okay, we do 6,000 transactions uh, per second. How do we do 6,000 transactions per second? Well, those 6,000 transactions represent some amount of opcodes. So 6,000 transactions, 6,000 opcodes, that has to run on a generalized computer, and that means that uh, every transaction can't take any more than two microseconds, right? And then basically you build your opcodes around that. With Solidity, it's like, it's so abstracted, how do you know? Right? That's the reason why uh, these guys started from the bottom up instead of top down. All right, all right, sorry. Um, I have no idea how to even scroll here. Uh, okay, I see. 
why do we need a so I'm going to mark this one as complete, yeah? Um, what are some of the negatives of the Algorand versus other blockchains? There are, there are a lot of negatives, but there, those negatives are primarily around management. So for example, um, if you're starting a new business, you have to find developers. How many people know how to develop in Teal? Right, in assembly. It's actually a lost art these days, assembly, to be honest with you. Uh, that's a problem. Um, so the tooling around it becomes a problem. Uh, there are also um, constraints. As we we're talking a little bit about constraints. So if you want to have such fast um, transactions, you have to have a lot of constraints. That means you have to also design uh, your, your applications um, with these constraints in mind. So it's not very general. So for these, for these reasons, uh, it can be a little bit tricky to work with Algorand versus other chains where it's just like, oh, we'll just do whatever we want. Right? Um, that would be the negatives in my view. Is it future-proof? How is it future-proof? Well, it's mostly future-proof in, in the sense that it can't be cracked with quantum computing. Um, this is actually a bigger deal than you think, uh, much bigger than you think. Um, well, they also have things built into it like uh, state proofs. Uh, what a state proof is, is it's a mathematical um, algorithm that reduces 256 blocks into a string that's 128 uh, bytes, I think. Yeah, 128 bytes. So with this one string, you can prove anything within the last 256 blocks. That's built directly into layer one. Uh, people are trying to do that now with, with ZK Snark and ZK Sync on Ethereum layer twos and so on. Uh, Algorand's already built that into layer one. So there's a lot of examples of this in, in, uh, in Algorand. Um, how does the efficiency of Algorand affect the security? Well, um, okay. So you have to go a little bit deeper when it comes to security. Um, security from a high level starts at the design of an application. So sometimes things are insecure because they're just bad ideas. Right? But let's imagine you have a, a, an idea that's not bad. And then you start to implement. Well, okay, if you're implementing, let's say, in uh, Solidity on Ethereum, um, Solidity then compiles down to an assembly language, just like Teal, that you don't see, which then compiles into a bytecode. Right? Um, but if you're not looking at the assembly language, how do you know what that compiler is actually outputting? Uh, you don't. You're just making assumptions, right? So there's a lot of times where um, Solidity, Pragmas are insecure, and you'll see that very recently actually Pragma 8.0 uh, was proven to be insecure, and there was a lot of things that happened, a lot of hacks and exploits that happened. They updated it to 8.6, 0.8.6, which is more secure, right? But you as a Solidity programmer have no idea about the insecurities because you're not looking at the layers below. With Teal, uh, you do, right? Um, and then in terms of, um, but then you go into deeper things. Uh, front running is a big problem in finance. So for example, uh, if I'm going to buy something from you and it's uh, $10 and that is based on a market condition, uh, someone knows I'm going to buy, they buy a lot more, it drives up the price, I pay $13 for it instead of 10 and then they dump their stuff at a higher price and basically they profit from the arbitrage that they've just created artificially in the market. That's, that, that happens a lot in finance. Um, especially in traditional finance, they have a thing called HFT, which is high frequency trading. This is exactly what they're doing. In, in Ethereum, that's incredibly easy to do because of Ethereum's design. They have a thing called MEV, uh, which is basically the practice of reading the transactions that have not yet been processed in the mempool, understanding what's going to come into, uh, into, onto the blockchain, and then doing a bunch of trading before those things happen uh, by doing nefarious things like either uh, paying off miners that prioritize their transactions instead of yours and so on. These things don't uh, happen on, on, on Algorand. So that, that is a major effect of security. How's Algorand's market pricing different from well, <laughs> okay. So, so a Pontonomics uh, system is is something that basically profits from incoming people. A, a good example of that is most game five projects, right? So, what they'll do is they'll say, okay, look, if you're the first player of the game, you buy an NFT and you get a bunch of stuff, right? Uh, now, you get rewarded for that, but there's no market for that reward yet. 
So how do we become, so you have these tokens, right? These uh, game tokens, but nobody wants to buy them. You're the only one that holds them. Nobody else cares about them, so they, they don't have a value. So how do we get a value? Well, we encourage other people to play the game. So you're the first one, now there's two people below you. Well, to play the game, these guys need tokens. Well, you have tokens. You sell your tokens to the new guys, right? Then they, have, they play the game, they have tokens. Well, who do they sell to? You're not interested anymore. So four guys come underneath them. They sell their tokens to the new guys, and so and so on and so forth. This is a this is a pyramid, right? That's what a Ponzanomic uh, tokenomics plan is. Um, you'll see that in a lot of cryptocurrencies around the world. How's Algorand different? Well, Algorand does not have a mint and burn strategy. So what a mint and burn strategy is is that in, in most chains like Ethereum. You can create tokens at any time, and you can delete tokens at any time. In Algorand, it's pre-minted. So you have to decide how many tokens you want from day one. So in the case of Algorand, the maximum number is 10 billion. That was what was created in Algorand. 10 billion is the max. That's what exists. There's no more ever coming, so there's no inflation. Right? Uh, this is the opposite of Ponzanomics. Um, are there any job opportunities? Do you mean in Algorand specifically or, or with us, with Algo Foundry? Uh, I will tell you that um, it is a very uh, active chain, Algorand. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, basically a lot of projects that are coming on. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, I will tell you one of the things that, one of the challenges we've had as a venture studio in Algorand is actually finding developers. And it was such a, a problem for us that in the beginning, there were no resources. We hired generalized uh, software engineers and we, we trained them internally to build stuff for Algren. And that uh, was not very sustainable. And so that's one of the reasons why as Algo Foundry, we actually came up with curriculum. So we have a curriculum called Fundamentals, uh, Dev and Specialist. Um, you, can, you can go take those classes online. Uh, there's also an immersive class. You can come to our office and sit there and we'll educate you in person. And we put those classes into universities. And the reason why we did that is not because we're altruistic, although there is some of that, but because we want to uh, get a whole bunch of students that know how to code on Algorand so we can hire them because we don't have enough developers. Right? So it's an elaborate um, recruiting mechanism. So yes, there are definitely opportunities in Algorand and also with us. Sorry, are we running out of time? Okay, yeah, sure. We can take a break. All right, get this one. And there are still uh, a few more questions, but let's take a 10 minutes break here and uh, let's talk to LT12 and then uh, there will be demos and more candidates. Okay, sure. And see you later. See you later. So, at this point, uh, we're going to do a, a little bit of a, a video of a demo. Um, this is part of uh, one of our curriculum that we put together about Teal. Um, it's not, not super long, right? Eight minutes. Eight, eight minutes, okay. So, eight minutes of one of our trainers uh, doing a little bit of coding in our grand um, project and sort of describing it. And then afterwards, I'll, I'll get back to the questions and answers, okay? So here we go. So, so in this demo, I would like to demonstrate some of the features for the two, for two programs. So there will be branching, there will be subroutines, we'll also be checking the transaction properties, and also we'll be looking at the passing of arguments when generating the logic signature for the program. Okay, so now let's take a look at the program code. So over here, this group, we have a main, we have a tool file. So the first line of this tool file will tell AVM to compile this program to tool version 6. After which, we'll look at the over this line, we will jump to the main loop. This is uh, B means branching, so you branch to the main loop. So in this main loop, over here, these three lines, basically it checks the first argument or the first program argument that's passed in. 
make sure it will uh it's function a the string function a and if it's function a you'll branch to function a and then over here if the first argument is function b you'll branch to function b otherwise you will, the program will error will return the error now let's take a look at function a so function a we will check the transaction amount we also check the second argument that's passed into the program we will convert this second argument to from bytes to integer and then we will actually multiply this uh, second argument with 1 million so basically this converts algos to micro algos and then we will do a check make sure that the amount is greater than this number of micro algos next we will call a subroutine so to call subroutine we will do a call sub so right now this is doing a is calling a subroutine for basic checks so over here this is the subroutine for basic checks so we have three different checks make sure that the wiki to the transaction wiki to is a zero address close remainder to is a zero address and the asset close to is a zero address and then over here we will do logical n to evaluate the result which will return one or zero for this basic check function or subroutine so back to function a so we will have two evaluation results here one or zero here one or zero and then we'll do logical n and then we'll return the result of this logical n as the output of the program so that's for function a for function b we'll call the basic checks subroutine next we will check whether the receiver is of this address so right now this address belongs to account 2 over here so we will get a result from either 1 or 0 here we get another result 1 or 0 here we will do logical n and return the output so that is the whole idea of this Teal program. Now we'll take a look at the transactions that will be subjected to this uh, checks by the program. So over in main.js, helper function submit transaction to the network. Next, I have this function generate logic sig. So what this does is it looks at the teal file, it compiles the teal file to program bytes. And then we will create a logic signature account using the program bytes and the arguments that's going to be passed in as a parameter. And then over here we have the signing. So what this does is the signer will delegate the signing authority to the logic signature. So transactions that are signed by this generator logic signature will be subjected to this uh, list of checks in this program so this will be uh, covered further in uh, our stateless smart contract lesson so over here with this this is the main function we will create a few accounts and then we will try to create transactions and we will submit transactions signed by the program logic so over here we are creating a logic signature so the sender will be the one that's creating this logic signature so the signing authority will be for the sender will be delegated to the this uh program we are passing trans we are passing program arguments so the program arguments are the string function a and also the minimum number of algos so also take note that we need to convert the arguments to bytes and then to UIN64 so that Teal knows how to interpret it.
and then next you create the unsigned transaction so this is a payment transaction we are submitting five algos which will be submitted which will be subjected to the checks in the main.tilfa file this transaction will be signed by the logic signature and submitted to the network so if there is a logic error this transaction will be rejected Next, we have the function b. So program arguments will be calling function b. We will generate a logic signature using the program arguments. And then we will do a payment transaction submitting to account 2, which is this. And then this will be signed by the logic signature generated over here. Okay, so now we will run the entire script to submit the two transactions. So as you can see, the transactions have been successfully submitted. So to demonstrate the logic rejection, so if let's say over here, if I were to change the address to a different address, this function B will fail. So over here, as you can see, the transaction has been rejected if the logic does not pass. Okay, so this concludes the demonstration for the various two functions as well as uh, re logic rejection or rejection by the two program. Testing. So, uh, riveting stuff, right? But um, that's basically the life of a software developer uh, building in Teal. Um, and basically what we were describing there was the, the one function that is available in Algorand that does not exist in other blockchains, which is the ability to do delegating the signing of transactions to a series of logic, right? Um, and it's pretty powerful. It can be pretty powerful. So I guess at this point I'm going to uh, move on to just finishing the, the questions. Uh, and uh, let's see, maybe we can go by, yeah, okay, it's ordered by uh, the most voted for, right? So how does carbon negativity work? Okay, well, basically... Um, Carbon use in any blockchain is related to electrical use, right? And the amount of um, energy that it's using translates into having to produce that energy and so on and so forth, right? Uh, with uh, Bitcoin, uh, which is the most egregious blockchain of them all, uh, and also Ethereum, they've, they've done some calculations about how much one transaction actually costs uh, in terms of energy use and Bitcoin it's it's something ridiculous. It's it's like each transaction is like 45 days of a typical household's of power Right for one transaction right? um, In Ethereum, it's a little bit better. It's like 13 days or something like this um, Algorand each transaction um, Uses so little uh, energy that uh, basically you can't even measure it. So why is that the case? Uh, Bitcoin uses uh, proof of work concept. So does Ethereum right now until the fork? Uh, proof of work means that there's a bunch of computers out there that have to make uh, mathematical calculations in order to get a chance of being selected as one of the validators. Um, they get paid to do that. Because they get paid to do that, everybody wants to also get paid. So there's more and more computers coming online to try and get a slice of that payment. And then what ends up happening is uh, it becomes more and more difficult to do the calculation. So, so then more and more people add more computers and this becomes a cycle where it's just that it runs away. Uh, typically, um, Proof of stake networks are a lot more efficient because all that you need for a proof of stake network to work is uh, a bunch of computers running, and um, they can be just normal computers, servers on on AWS or you know 
can it can even run on a Raspberry Pi, right? And those things just uh, basically make the calculations, and it, does, it doesn't get harder. So typically speaking, they use a lot less energy. Um, Algorand specifically, if you if you talk about the nodes for Algorand, they actually run on Raspberry Pis. That's how little transaction power they need, right? And so because they they have no or very little uh, energy use. Uh, it's very low carbon impact, and then what Algorand does is it buys carbon credits and uh, renewable energy certificates to offset or even negatively offset the uh, little energy that it does use. So that's why it's carbon neg negative. Are you open for interns? Yes, we are. We love interns. Um, if you're interested in an internship, Doreen over here is the one that makes those decisions. Um, you can email her directly and you can find the email on our website which is algofoundry.studio and it, it'll be in our material here. All right. Why is it perceived to be more acceptable by institutions? Well, you know, um, let, let's just uh, take a step back and just think about what does an institution care about? Right. Um, let's imagine you're, I don't know, a bank. Let's say DBS, and you're sitting on uh, 13 billion, 12 billion dollars worth of assets, and a lot of those assets are given to you actually because you're a bank uh, by other people. So you're managing accounts, you're managing deposits, uh, you're managing a whole bunch of stuff. That's not really your money, but you're managing it, right? So what are the things that do you think that that institution is going to care about more than anything else? Right? So the first thing typically is regulation. So all banks are regulated by governments and they have to follow these laws and regulations and if they don't, they get big problems, they have to pay fines, where do they get the money for the fines from? So in some cases they get their licenses revoked, which means they can't operate anymore. In other cases, people have actually gone to prison, right? So they care about following the rules more than they care about anything else. So that's number one. Number two is security, right? So banks care a lot about security because since they are controlling so much money, um, they are targets for anybody who wants money, right? So you've you've heard a lot about bank robberies in the in the past. That was when physical security mattered. So people would break into banks and steal money out of the vaults. They'd break into the the armored cars that are transferring money between the different banks. Um, that's physical security. As we, as we've gone more and more towards uh, digitization. Now, digital security matters, right? Um, and so that's a big concern. Uh, on top of that, how do banks actually profit? How do institutions profit? They, they profit by trading and they, and they take a uh, spread in terms of the terms. So someone will give them $1,000, they'll give that to someone else and they'll say to that second person, you gotta give me 1,100 back. Right, and so that hundred is their profit. Um, in those trades that are occurring, they care about the, the the fidelity of the trade. So if they give someone a thousand dollars and expect to get eleven hundred back, and in that giving of that thousand dollars, something happens, and they don't get their money back, or that person doesn't receive their money, that's a big problem, right? Um, so for all these reasons, institutions care about predictability security, regulation, and these types of things. So, uh, you know, why wouldn't a, a institution pick something like Ethereum, for example? They absolutely will not. And the, and the reason is, is that there is no way to secure it, right? Uh, go take a look at all the applications that are running on Ethereum, all the hacks that have happened in the blockchain space. You're gonna see Majority of them are in EVM chains. Majority. There are some on Solana, don't get me wrong. But majority are on EVM. And the reason for that is it's a generalized computing platform that's extremely complicated, makes it very hard to secure. It doesn't have constraints, number one. Number two, the way that their mempool works makes it very hard to stop front running. So you can, you can actually um, do something that's not nefarious at all create this beautiful protocol, have lots of liquidity, people want to interact with it, and then someone else will say, oh, hold on a second, 
before someone interacts with it, I'm going to do my transaction that will make their transaction more expensive, and I'm going to profit on the on the in between, right? Banks and institutions are not going to accept that. Absolutely will not. Ethereum and 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 Bitcoin and other uh, uh, blockchains out there also have a problem in terms of um, repudiation and an anonymity. So uh, things like Tornado Cash, for example, that exist. You put your your money into a pool. It, it's mixed with a whole bunch of other people's cryptocurrency. It comes out at random times, at random amounts later. Nobody knows that it was yours, right? This, this is a big problem for regulation. It's a big problem, right? Those type of things don't exist on Algorand. So for these reasons and a, and a bunch of others, um, you'll, you'll start to see that, that chains that are very specific uh, and built around certain constraints will, will become institutional favorites. <coughs> Uh, whoop. I'm sorry, I, I did something bad there. I missed a question. Repeat it. If I, I think I, I clicked it off too quickly, uh, will proof of stake bring Matthew effect into Algorand? Hmm. That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, maybe that's for another time. Sorry, that, that's a little. That's a little bit of a in-depth uh, conversation. I think more than I want to have right now. Uh, does Algorand have an office in Singapore? Yes, it does. Uh, Algorand is divided into two different pieces. There's a Inc. and a foundation. The Inc. Uh, drives all the technology, so they, they do the protocol itself and all the development around that. Um, that is based in Massachusetts in the uh, United States, in, in Boston, um, near MIT. Uh, there is also a foundation. A foundation manages the treasury, so all of the available additional funds that Algorand has is managed by the foundation, and they use that to try and drive adoption. So they do hackathons, education, um, outreach, and all kinds of things around it. They, they give grants, they invest in applications that are going to Algorand. Um, so the foundation is a Singapore entity, and it's, it's operated here in Singapore. Uh, their office is uh, shared with us in Algo Foundry uh, in downtown Singapore. All right. Uh, all governments around the world willing to accept blockchain something that they cannot control? Yes, absolutely, they will. They will absolutely do it. Um, what, what governments do care about controlling is, is, um, is actually money more than anything else. I mean, they care about controlling other things, but mostly it's about controlling money. And the reality is, is that uh, there are a lot of different ways to obfuscate uh, money, but it all comes down to, at the end of the day, it all comes down to exchange. So the exchange parts um, are where the bottlenecks are, um, and those bottlenecks are, are carefully controlled and, and monitored by governments, and as long as they maintain those monitoring stations, uh, they don't care about the rest of it. Then it just becomes about efficiency. So, so. One example I can tell you uh, from, from my own personal journey on this is like, for, for example, in the United States, and, and it's the same everywhere, but I know about the United States because it's from my own personal experience. Um, a lot of people try to move their funds outside of the United States to avoid taxes. Right? And so, uh, and corporations do this more than individuals. To be honest, like Apple is a big, a big problem uh, corporation that does this extensively. And one of the issues then is they have to move the funds back in to spend it, right? So, so when they move their funds out of the United States, one of the prime examples of where they put it is the Caribbean. Uh, the Caribbean has its own currency called the East Caribbean dollar. A lot of stuff happens there. But then, when you want to move it back into U.S. dollars to be able to spend in the U.S. It needs to be exchanged. Well, there's only one place that exchanges it, and everything that gets exchanged goes through that one place, and the U.S. government monitors that very closely. So you don't get away with it. When you bring your money back in, they tax you. Right? The same thing is going to happen uh, with cryptocurrencies. Um, the government will absolutely regulate very, very strongly the exchange points, and so that for this reason, they, they don't care about um, crypto that much. Is DDoS due to low fee problem in Algorand? Um, I mean, potentially, you'd have to spend a lot of money to do it. Uh, DDoS with low fees uh, is something that attacks uh, networks that have very uh, slow TPS. So uh, Ethereum, for example, is a prime example of this. They, they, 
they do 13 transactions a second, something like this. Uh, it's possible to really screw up the network by putting a lot of uh, transactions into the mempool that will never get processed, but you're just flooding it, so you're denying the service for other people. Um, this does happen on, on AVAX, on uh, Polygon, and these types of things as well, uh, less so. In Algorand, um, the number of transactions a second is, is already at 6,000. It's very, very hard, very hard to disrupt that. I'm not saying it's impossible. You'd have to spend a lot more. And the fees are already set, so there's no, um, there's no bidding system like in Ethereum. It's, the bidding works in a way that you know, since there's only going to be 13 transactions a second, let's say there's 100 that want to go through, then I'm going to pay more than you, so my transaction will go through, right? So it's based on an auction-based system. In Algorand, the fees are flat. There's no auction, right? Um, so I don't think this will affect Algorand as much, if at all. So now, great. And that was all the questions, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. Let's start with that. For this uh, wonderful talk, and also uh, a lot of questions to come soon. Uh, I think we've learned a lot. Um, okay. So, uh, any last minute question before we get to? Well, you just just a reminder from next week. Since next week is uh, <coughs> Uh, so I will do the Ethereum tutorial a lot. So later I'll send, set up an email, go set up a Zoom meeting, and next week at the same time you can join uh, the Ethereum meeting. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Amazing. Thanks, guys.